tomorrow uh, the test review is due. So uh, 60 questions on the test review. Again, if you have any trouble with those, let me know. Um, I'm thinking the way the test will go, just so uh, it's kind of available to everybody because it was part of the review, uh, is I will let you l use the PowerPoints. Um, now, there's one caveat here. You can use the PowerPoints, um, but it's not going to be an excuse for, it's, for you slowing down in the test. Um, and so only use them for the questions you need them for. Make sure you study. Make sure you can answer some of the questions. Because uh, there's four PowerPoints, and they're they're not like an insignificant number of slides. Uh, so, like for example, this is not one of the PowerPoints, but this is 87 slides, and that's just one chapter. So, if you're having to look up every answer from the PowerPoints, you're not going to be able to get done in time. Yes. Uh, depends on we got a bunch of people out Thursday and Friday. So it depends on what day you're here. Uh, ideally, I'd like you to take the test Thursday. Okay, so we're going to be able to get to Friday so we can take it tomorrow. Yes, yeah, yeah, Because if you're not going to be here Friday, you definitely want to get it taken tomorrow. Yeah. If you're not going to be here Thursday or Friday, uh, the test will be open. I don't know. I guess you could take it from home or you can wait until Monday or you can. Oh, well, I guess Monday would be a week from. Monday, yeah, right. Uh, so yes, I was I was anticipating everybody being here one of those two days, but I'm seeing now that there's lots of people that won't. Uh, so yeah, you can take it from home or something. Uh, you know, just uh, we'll we'll work something out. Cause uh, I got another student second period that's not gonna be here Thursday or Friday. How many questions are on it? Uh, I haven't narrowed it down yet, but in between uh thirty and thirty five. So easily done within one class period. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I don't remember the exact slide we left off on, but I want to go ahead and change. So never mind. Y'all won't ever use this. Uh, I always have to go in here and change my slideshow because I want to have the controls. Okay. And let me save this so it saves that way. Did it save? What's it doing? It doesn't like that. Okay, I'll do it later. Yeah. Oh, no. oh, I got a, I got a thing here. Enable saving. Yeah. You're like, do you, are you sure you want to save? Is that a I thing you want to do? Question. Do you huh? know anything about harp? Do I know anything about what? Harp. Harp. Like it's what? Like, um, shoot, what's like, it's like a. Like medical stuff. No, it's like this huge thing. Electricity, like all these little things, and people say that it shoots electricity in the sky. What? Are you giving me conspiracy theory stuff? No, it's like an actual thing. It shoots. It's a high frequency active auroral research program. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You never heard anything about it? No. Um, people were saying on TikTok. <laughs> that's that, okay. That Harper was sending this electricity shooting up into the sky, and that's why the weather changed. No, 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 no. Uh, you should read that. I, I will read about that project because that does sound a little bit interesting. But uh, controlling the weather, negative, negative. Uh, I wish. We all wish. Um, but that, then that would probably lead to like some dystopian thing where all the weather's terrible because we thought we could do good. But it's in like, Alaska. we're like, we want everything to be Hawaii weather. And then it all ends up being like Alaska weather. And we just get cold everywhere. No, 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 no. Yeah, that, that gives us way more credit than, than we deserve. Like being able to control the weather. Please, please. Um, and, and the truth is, if you ever take a oceanography or weather class from someone who studies the weather, um, you see that our ability to control the weather is probably never, ever going to be anything because it's all, there's so many things that go into weather. Um, that's why we literally have trouble like predicting weather more than a week out. Uh, if you go fat, further than seven days, we're like, it could happen, but it could really change at, at any point in time. Uh, and it, there's just so many things that go into it. And doing like a weather forecast, those people 
have the biggest, most powerful computers at the TV station. I promise you. Uh, they have. Well, but that just shows you how hard it is. And so if we can't even like predict weather that great a week or two in advance, our ability to like control and change the weather is going to be none, none whatsoever. Uh, and what is it? It's high frequency radio waves. High frequency. High frequency. Yeah, high frequency. Anything isn't gonna gonna interact with the weather. Uh, high frequency active. Yeah, you're you're talking about light waves and radio waves there, and that's not that's not gonna affect like a a, a piece of air large enough to to change the weather in any way. Uh, so yeah, don't don't worry about that. Uh, I will research it and look into it, but not to see if it's changing the weather. It's not changing. The weather. Uh, it's just cold air from Canada. It's our Canadian neighbor neighbors giving us a nice gift. Uh, we got a week off. We got a week off. What's everybody? I mean, psh, yeah, just because the entire state's that. electrical grid failed. I mean, we get a week off of school and work, and now we don't have to wear masks again. Everything's fine, right? <laughs> right? Everything's okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the uh, people. People forget that. Like, I always hated the people that come in to your work on the weekend and be like, "Sure, glad it's the weekend, right?" And it's like you realize you're talking to someone who's currently at work, and it's not the weekend for me. Uh, and it's really like rude of you to brag about your weekend while I'm at work. Uh, specifically, I'm at work to serve you while you're on your weekend. Uh, you're not making me feel any better. I always hated that. So I try not to do that. When I go to the grocery store on Sunday, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, Sunday, it's the weekend. Uh, I know it's not the weekend for them. They're at work. So uh, where are we at? I feel like I went further than I should have. Oh, we got to hazards and natural service functions. Um, and this one actually does have some good natural service functions. So they're going between some linkages to other hazards here. Um, yeah, so they were talking about uh, Mount St. Helens here. We finished up with Mount St. Helens. Uh, what they're talking about now is linkages between volcanoes and other natural hazards. So obviously, lava can start a fire. That fire could continue to spread. Um, a, a eruption of a volcano can cause an earthquake um, or vice versa. The earthquake uh, caused the eruption of Mount St. Helens, um, although they kind of happened simultaneously. So what really causes what? Um, a landslide can happen, especially like Mount St. Helens, where half your volcano kind of collapses. Um, if you spew enough volcanic gas, never, I, I don't think you'd have a volcano that could single-handedly cause large climate change. Um, you know, Yellowstone, if Yellowstone went off by itself, it could maybe cause a little bit of uh, near-term climate change. Um, but if I have a increased volcanic period where I have hundreds or thousands of volcanoes erupting in a short period of time, uh, they could heavily contribute to climate change and global cooling uh, because of all the ash in the air. Uh, now, natural service functions. This is one of the um, the the hazards, the national natural hazards that actually does have some good stuff come from it. Um, volcanic soils are a good thing. Um, has anybody ever been to Hawaii? Y'all went to Hawaii, right? Um, they actually grow, like, they have pineapple fields in Hawaii. And they have quite... Yeah, nice, nice. Um, and so volcanic soils are very rich in certain minerals um, and can grow really, really good stuff. Um, so good for growing coffee, uh, corn, pineapple, sugarcane, and grapes. Um if anybody gets a chance, uh, one of the big things now, which I've heard from other people because I don't travel and don't assume that I've been to any of these places, um, but if you're on your way over to Europe, one of the big things now is to take a small layover in Iceland um, because Iceland has this really nice geothermal uh, power plant where you can go and swim in this basically like warm lagoon that's uh, runoff water from their geothermal plant. And it's like icy and cold outside. It's like freezing outside, but you're just like lounging in this really warm pool and it's supposed to be super nice. Uh, and so that's another thing that can come from volcanoes is geothermal power, using that heat to benefit you uh, and your city. And then mineral resources. Um, 
the vast majority of diamonds that, that we get out of the ground are, are found in volcanic necks. Um, gold and silver are also associated with volcanic uh, materials. Uh, what else then? Use for soap, building stone, aggregates for roads, railroads, etc. Uh, pumice stone is a volcanic rock, and we use that to kind of scrape the dead skin off our feet or hands. Uh, and then obviously recreation. Uh, Hawaii has all sorts of awesome places to go and hike and, and uh, kayak and do all sorts of crazy things. Um, and the entire island itself is volcanic land. So uh, we're creating new land out there. In fact, uh, right now there's a new Hawaiian island being built. Um, do I have... Here, let me show you. If it pulls up. Open, you fool. There you go. You got to do the triple tap. Uh, and actually, let me come back here because I don't know that I can control this super well. Uh, where's Hawaii? Here. Here's the United States. There's Hawaii. Yep, right in the middle. And so here's Hawaii. And then right over here. I don't know which one it is. One of these over here is, is like the newest volcano. Uh, and so if, if this continues to build and continues to uh, get, get uh, eruptions, you can have a new island right here. I think this is actually the one that might be the closest to becoming the new island. The Lohi Seamount, I think I remember Lohi. I think that. I remember that being the one. Um, and so you can see with Hawaii, these volcanic underwater kind of mountains all stretch out way out here. And you can follow this line like all the way out here and all the way up here to like the tip of Alaska. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing really this way. That's because the volcanoes haven't started here yet. Um, so as long as these continue to build, we have a new like volcanic island of Hawaii pop up in the next couple million or hundred million years. Now, that being said, once this volcano on Kauai stops being active and stops erupting, um, the island is going to be subjected to weathering and erosion. And if it weathers and erodes enough, um, it could go back down below sea level and essentially disappear as an island and it would be underwater. Um, Hopefully, we can kind of keep that from happening. Uh, we as humans are pretty good at, at bringing in uh, trees and, and different support systems to kind of help save the islands. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that we went and studied uh, when we took our field trip to Key West, which, by the way, I know I mentioned this before. Probably not the greatest field trip ever because I'm sure, you know, you could go to Hawaii and uh, our original intent was to spend a couple of days in Jamaica, but uh, we had a visa issues with a lot of the foreign students. Um, yeah, we came down here to Key West, and uh, you can really see the different areas where land is being built because trees are kind of trapping in soil, and it's able to kind of collect there and, and add to the, the volume of land. And then you can see other other areas where they're losing land, where it's being swept out to sea, um, especially kind of in between the islands where the water comes in and comes back out. It sweeps a lot of sediment away. Uh, and so you can have erosion take away an island really quick. Um, or if you go back to like the Hawaiian Islands, you have a couple big eruptions in a row. Um, you can have volcanoes build a new island pretty quick. Um, just to point out, these are not volcanic islands. These are reef islands. So there's no volcanics here at all. I'm just talking about erosion kind of taking away islands. So, uh, yeah, Google Earth is nice. I like Google Earth. So recreation and creation of new land, those are your natural service functions. So not all volcanoes are terrible, terrible things. There's a lot of good things that come from volcanoes and us living around them. Um, what do you do to minimize the volcanic hazard? Um, forecasting is a major component to reduce volcanic hazards. Um, 
You want to forecast not just when the volcano might erupt and, and in what kind of manner, um, but what kind of other events may happen. So if you think there could be a landslide or a mud flow or something like that, uh, that that's going to help you kind of plan and prepare. Uh, the same thing with ash. Even if you don't live near a volcano, um, like if you live in, let's say, Wyoming, Wyoming doesn't really have any volcanoes, but the prevailing winds are generally blowing air from the Washington, Oregon area into Wyoming and Montana. And so while if you live in Wyoming, Montana, you may not have a super high risk for volcanoes. If one of those West Coast volcanoes erupts, you're more than likely going to get the brunt of that ash. Um, and so as a farmer in Wyoming or Montana, I want to be aware of what kind of ash fall I could get, uh, where it possibly could go based on the prevailing winds and what I can do to kind of protect my property and my crops from it. Um, so forecasting is a probabilistic statement. It's not going to give you a definite time and place that it's going to happen, um, but it's going to give you a, a likelihood that that kind of thing takes place. Um, so we're, we're not to the point where we can predict a, a earthquake happening, uh, not, not an earthquake, a volcanic eruption happening, um, but we are to the point where we can recognize the signs and say, hey, this volcano is waking back up. I don't know when it's gonna blow up or if it's gonna go back to sleep, um, but the chances are rising right now and it's showing signs that it could have an eruption. Uh, so forecasting, unlikely to accurately forecast uh, the majority of volcanic activity in the near future. We're just not there yet. Uh, we need more experience with actual eruptions. Uh, we need to better able to predict eruptions in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and we kind of had something happen like this a couple years ago. Um, some new fissures opened up in the Hawaiian Islands in areas that they didn't expect. Um, some of them right in the middle of neighborhoods. They had to evacuate some people. There were fires. Um, it got a little scary there for a little while. I don't know that anybody died in those, um, but it was just an example, even in Hawaii, where it's been erupting for like decades now, and we're, we're pretty familiar with how it works and where it erupts from. Uh, you can still have surprises. So uh, the better we can pre predict those surprises, the better off we'll be. Forecasting uses information gauged by um, looking at your seismic activity. Before there's a major eruption, you're probably going to have some rumbling, some things shifting around, and the volcano kind of uh, getting some weaknesses in different areas. Uh, monitoring thermal, magnetic, and hydrological conditions. Um, that thermal part is important. If you can look and see, like, is the volcano getting hotter? Can I kind of see the, the lava rising up or the magma rising up towards the surface? Um, that can indicate that we're getting much, much closer to a volcanic eruption. Because, you know, your volcano is not going to erupt from this phase. Um, you still have a lot of work to do before your lava or magma gets up to the surface. Um, if you can kind of spot these intermediary phases before it really gets up to the point where it's primed and ready to go, you can have a little bit of, of warning going on. Now, you won't know. It says two to three weeks in development. You won't really know when that big thing is going to happen or if it's going to kind of pull back and not do anything at all. Um, but you can start to warn people, make plans, um, get evacuation routes prepared, and kind of have everybody hopefully ready to go. Uh, let's see. Land surface monitoring. Monitoring volcanic gases. If it starts to spit out more CO2 or sulfur dioxide, uh, that's going to be a good indicator. And then geological history. Um, it sounds crazy, but the longer you wait in between volcanic eruptions, um, the more likely it is to happen. Um, it's just kind of a, a numbers game. So you look at the geologic history, you map the volcanic rocks and their deposits and try to have an idea of how often it erupts. Um, and if it erupts on average every thousand years and you're like, okay, well, before now it's erupted every thousand years. But since the last eruption, it's been 2,000 years. Well, now I know I'm overdue. Um, and if I'm overdue, it could happen at any point in time, and I would expect it to happen um, before another 1,000 years happens because that's just the odds. 
so looking at the history can kind of give you an idea of what's going to happen here. Um, inflation and tilting before eruption. And this is another thing. So this is almost like trying to predict the stock market. Uh, the stocks go up, the stocks go up, and then at some unexpected point, they go down. And there's really no, there's, there's very little indication as to when that eruption is actually going to happen. Um, you see the buildup. So at any point here, it's probable. It's probable. Um, and maybe even right here, they're like, oh, that's a big spike. This could be it. And then it doesn't happen. And it, it, you wait a couple more weeks or a couple months. And then all of a sudden you have your eruption. All your pressure is released. Right after an eruption, down here, you have almost no chance of another eruption. Um, the pressure is low. Your activity is low. It's going to take you a good, you know, they have months here and not years. Uh, so I don't know exactly what, oops, uh, I don't know exactly what volcano they're talking about there. Maybe if we had the book, they would have a little bit more information, but, um, you can see the kind of build up. You have an eruption. It releases the pressure. You have to build up again before you can have another eruption. Uh, and, and after each successful eruption, your, your chance of a, another eruption right after that goes way, way down. So that's, that's what we kind of look for. Um, we don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but we can, we can have an idea of, of what's a good idea or what's a good time to kind of plan for it. So USGS alert notification system. Um, just so you know, USGS stands for United States Geological Survey. Uh, and we, we take a look at all sorts of geological things. So not just volcanoes, um, but earthquakes and landslides and all sorts of land substance stuff. Um, so for volcanoes, they have four levels. Green is normal, yellow is advisory, um, orange is a watch, and then red is a warning. Um, if you're in a red area, you should probably be packing your stuff. Uh, you should have a go bag and uh, be ready to leave at any moment. Because uh, you never know when, when it's going to erupt. For some eruptions, hazards on the ground or in the air will differ, uh, and high alerts or codes will be issued. Um, you know, it's not just for the eruption. It could be for ash or any other kind of hazards that might happen around your volcano. Uh, let's see. So they give you a little bit more detail on these. So outside of green, yellow, orange, and red, they have some conditions that kind of can be met for each of these. Um, perceptions of volcanic hazard. So people that don't live near volcanoes are always like, why do you live near a volcano? Um, people from Texas are like, why would Californians live in an earthquake zone? They're like your building could just fall down on you at any time. And people from California are like, why do Texans live in Tornado Alley? The sky could just come down and suck you up at any point in time. Uh, and so we all kind of judge other people, but you live where you live. Um, either you were born there or you moved there for a reason. Um, and, you know, I'm never going to judge a Hawaiian for living in Hawaii because uh, it's amazing there. And, yeah, you might have to deal with your island exploding in a volcanic eruption. But 99 out of 100 days, you're doing great. It's perfect over there. Uh, so why wouldn't you want to live in Hawaii? Um, why wouldn't you want to live in Florida right on the beach? I mean, Florida's got its problems and everything, but the beaches are nice. Uh, yeah, they get hit by hurricanes almost every single year, sometimes twice a year. And your house might get knocked down a couple times. Uh, but I don't see a bunch of people leaving Florida because that they're like, I'll just go and build my house back again because it's Florida. Uh, so, you know, those things are going to happen and kind of prepare. Um, most people, like many of us here in this class, are here because we were born here. And it's kind of hard to leave the places that you were born. Um, also you, you have different areas, uh, fertile land for farming. Uh, I don't know. If there's a lot of manufacturing in Hawaii, um, but they do do a lot of farming. They have a lot of tourism. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of reasons to live around volcanoes. Uh, Japan is, is all volcanoes and they have huge industry, um, lots of, uh, farmland and, and production there. Although I don't know that they're producing an immense amount but they've got nice green green islands there so uh yeah good education can help people understand volcanic hazards uh which is always a good thing that's why we're talking about it right now volcanic crisis can develop when scientists predict a volcanic hazard for the near future um and we 
not just with volcanoes. We try to keep scientists from doing this. Um, it always looks bad when a scientist comes out and is like, this is going to happen, and then it doesn't. Um, it it kind of erodes trust. And I can just think back to the the uh, the Korean uh, missile debacle in Hawaii a couple years ago. Y'all remember that? Yeah, like the, the false alarm, and they were like, missiles are on the way, duck and cover. Um, and it was just like a test system gone bad. Uh, and you know, next time people get a text on their phone in Hawaii that missiles are coming, they're probably not going to react the way you want them to react because you lied to them the first time. Uh, and so you try to keep scientists from coming out and being like, there's going to be an earthquake today or the volcano is going to erupt tomorrow because uh, you, you want everybody to have a trust in your science. So um, as frustrating as it is, and as many uh, – hold on, let me pause this with all that. So uh, let's see. Hydraulic chilling attempts to control lava flows. This is actually interesting. I like this stuff because uh, this is totally a – a human being thing uh oh is the world leaking it's like lava blood onto the surface let me see if i can change that somehow uh let me put some water on it and see if i can keep it from going places uh let me build a wall to kind of like move the lava away from my house uh and it's great i love it it works to varying degrees um and in some places they can actually control where your lava flow goes um, bulldozers were moved up to slow the flow for a wa uh, for a large water pipe. And then let's see. So you can kind of see it coming over these houses here. Um, man, I thought they had a picture of a wall. I've seen a picture of a wall. You know how they have the highway dividers here in Texas, like the little concrete half walls that they just in sections they can place. Um, I, I've seen pictures of them doing that in Hawaii. So like the, the lava is coming down a certain direction. They don't want it to go straight. They want it to kind of curve that way. And so they just line up the highway dividers and make like a little curve for it. And the lava hits it and kind of goes a different direction. Uh, it's not always going to work because obviously you can get enough buildup where it just goes where it wants to go. Um, but we have a limited ability to control which way the, the lava is flowing. And so that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so now we go back to the Iceland volcano of 2010. Uh, and we, we try to think about how we can look at this volcano in, in a context of what we've learned in this chapter. So Iceland sits atop a hot, is that true? A hot spot. Okay. Right off the bat, I'm having issues with this. Uh, in general, hot spots are not considered to be right on top of a spreading center. Uh, what Iceland sits on top of, I would change this, is a, a mid-ocean ridge, a spreading center. Um, so it's kind of being pulled apart. Uh, you can call it a hot spot in a little bit. What we use the term hot spot for is a, a plume of mantle coming up, not associated with any plate tectonic ridges or anything like that. Um, so like Hawaii or Yellowstone, right in the middle of a plate. Uh, this is not right in the middle of a plate. I'd have a hard time calling it a hot spot, but we'll move on. Um, volcanic eruptions happen once every three to four years, which is pretty frequent. Um, fortunately, most Icelandic eruptions are generally effusive and have a VIE of no more than one. This means they're very calm. Um, they're not violent, explosive eruptions. They're almost like uh, Hawaiian eruptions where it just kind of bubbles out to the surface. You might have a lot of ash, um, but the whole island's not like exploding. Uh, most volcanoes are localized. Uh, this changed with the volcano in 2010. Uh, I think because they were talking about Mount St. Helens, this is going to be one of the ones that is a more explosive kind of volcano. Um, so several signs that seismic activity become more shallow, so it kind of moved up to the surface. Um, uplifting and tilting were detected so they could actually see the mountain change shape and, and orientation a little bit. And then rate of deformation was as much as five millimeters per day. Um, so you're, you're getting a change that's much, much faster than your normal change uh, on a regular day. So here's a map of Iceland. Uh, you can see Iceland is right on this mid-ocean ridge between uh, the, Atlant uh, the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. 
And then the volcano that we're talking about is right here at the bottom part of the island. So the southern tip of the island, uh, you have these two volcanoes, and the one that erupted is the left one. Um, so here's, well, actually, I guess this is the same volcano, just two different eruptions. Um, so this one happened, the summit eruption was April 14th, 2010, and they had a flank eruption at March 20th, 2010. So same volcano, just different areas of the eruption. And they kind of show you a map. This is actually pretty nice. You can see the, the buildup towards this eruption. So uh, ah, I don't know what the blue and green lines differentiate. Maybe the regular uh, volcano and like the flank of the volcano. We can see both of them had a, a sharp uptick in activity just before the eruption happened. Um, I will note the blue one was quite a bit more dramatic than the green one. Um, the green one came up, but didn't have that like shooting up uh, kind of rise before the eruption. So, yes. Oh, the bell's ring. Okay, right, I'm done. Go. Have a nice day, everybody. And remember to get the review done and be prepared for the test tomorrow. Have a nice day.